the episode Day of Armageddon. And its return from Francis Watson, who was chief engineer at Yorkshire TV, was a cause for a great deal of rejoicing. On our Mission to the Unknown podcast last year, we had Jack Rayner on. She, she described how excited she was by its return. And I'm, I'm just going to play in a clip so you can hear that again. With episode two, uh, Day of Armageddon coming back, that overturned everything. Yeah. Because up to that point, I think people thought, you know, the Christmas tree was in Dalek Master Plan. We suddenly discover he isn't. Mm. Therefore, we rearrange the names and figure out that, oh, he's central because he's the one that doesn't appear later. And, you know, things like that. There was they showed a clip on, I think, the six o'clock news with Mavic Chen. And then it cut to about half a second of Zephon coming down a slope. Oh, yes. It was like, oh, my God, that was a delicate mess. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we sort of knew what Zephon looked like because we've got that one shot of him menacing Mavic Chen. Yeah. But this was him moving and with clothes on and you know, all this <laughs> stuff. So, you know, they sh- the, the news, they focused on the Daleks. And, you know, we knew what the Daleks looked like. <laughs> yeah. um, and we had to wait to see the delegates. And, yeah, I think the first thing was possibly BBC Online putting it up as a photo book. And you suddenly saw all these, myself and all the many other delegate scholars in Doctor Who fandom, (laughs) suddenly realised we had to tear up most of our research. But, yeah, that was amazing. That really was. Um, Of all episodes uh, to come back, that is very possibly the one that gave us so much new information Hmm. yeah oh just so exciting so exciting i'm yeah. still excited now <laughs> well you've only had 15 years so it's, it's perfectly understandable exactly. um, Hello and welcome to Something Who, episode 23. In a break with our recent tradition, today I'm speaking with not one, but two special guests who are appearing separately for logistical reasons. It's Rich Tipple, known to his legion of fans as Sir Far From. Hello Rich, and welcome to Something Who. Hey, thanks very much. I'm not sure about a legion of fans, but that sounds that sounds wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I think it must be because uh, I, I noticed the tweet you put out to say you were on this uh, today has already had a, a bunch of likes. It's certainly it's getting liked much faster than anything that we normally put out. So that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's great news. Yeah, yeah. So Rich is here to talk about colorizing black and white stories of Doctor Who, and in particular the episode Day of Armageddon that, that you've recently colorised and, and which launched at uh, the Gallifrey Convention in America. But we, I guess before we discuss the colorization, I thought it might be interesting to have a chat about the episode itself. And perhaps the first thing we could say is that it used to be a missing episode for many years until it was returned, you know, what feels like, to me, not all that long ago, but actually when we had a look a minute ago, it was 16 years ago. Rich, what do you make of, of Day of Armageddon? as a missing episode you remember that happening yourself the return i do remember it vividly yeah i remember getting my doctor who magazine and just being absolutely well it was before the magazine arrived i think it was on bbc news and you know it was everywhere and the excitement building up around it you know um, i think they had somebody interviewed and you could see a snippet of it playing on the monitor behind them and people were sort of gleaning at it trying to see a delegate you know and all of that sort of stuff it was an incredibly exciting time anything to do with dalek's master plan really seems to capture people's imagination and so when you get an entire 25 minute chunk back mm. it's incredible i rem- i remember i remember the date vividly Mm. Uh, and I remember I've still got my Doctor Who magazine of it, and I remember poring over the details and waiting desperately for uh, for its DVD release. Mm. I think it's it's fascinating as well because it's it's a window into a very lost era, you know, without telesnaps, very few episodes, not very many photos. I, mean, I guess we might come into that later on. And and here you've got Brett Vion uh, and Katarina. 
um, and really apart from those Blue Peter clips that, that, that that's the only um, time we see them on screen uh, you've got Stephen, um, you know, one of the more lost companions as well. So, so another one of his episodes, and perhaps, you know, interesting to see uh, Mavic Chen more in situ than he is in in the in the later episodes in the story. Absolutely, I mean, it's a phenomenal cast, isn't it? When you look at the names, you know, absolutely exciting. Uh, when it came back, I think it's, it still is. It's our first full episode, our only full episode of um, Katarina. Yeah. Which you know, without without this, we just we wouldn't have a, anything, would we, at all, no. to go on. Um, so it's you know, from that point of view, it makes it fairly unique. Obviously, you've got Mavic Chen, which is one of Doctor Who's all time greatest villains, in in my opinion, um, mm. performed absolutely brilliantly by Kevin Stoney. You've got Peter Purves is is wonderful. Hartnell's in his 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 full pomp, you know, and um, it's. Directed by Douglas Canfield, I, I don't really know what more you could want. Really, for me, mm. if you ask me to to come up with a a, a wish list uh, of a of my dream Doctor Who episode, I would probably I would probably want to include Peter Purves and um, Stoney and Hartnell, and uh, why not even have Nicholas Courtney in there as well? You know, mm. <laughs> it's uh, it absolutely six every single box going. Mm. And we get a good chance as well to to to, to have a a close look at the um, alien delegates, which you know is fascinating. It, it's quite a um, almost a spooky scene when they sort of appear out of darkness at the back of the set and sort of uh, emerge. Each of them doing their own kind of unique walk. It's yeah, it's 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 a wonderful bit of kind of sixties sci-fi that isn't it seeing yeah. them all sort of kind of glide and do their spacewalks or whatever they're doing you know um but it, it soon goes from you know the sort of <laughs> quite quite bizarre to something very real and very scary and very interesting you know doctor who in the 60s has this amazing ability to take kind of quite farcical maybe silly things sometimes and turn it into something that's quite quite menacing actually mm. in many ways um, there's a wonderful shot where the camera pans across the delegates and you see them and I think I can't remember which delegate is he asked a question of, of Mavic Chen and there's clearly a little bit of tension there um, it's just it, it's just a wonderful moment it's it, it's well written but it's beautifully directed and it's it's acted with such conviction as well mm. you know and it, it's just it's just a joy it's it's almost the perfect 25 minutes of Doctor Who. It's quite a different feel, isn't it, that Dave Armageddon to the other episodes we've got, in that, you know, episode 10 is almost a, a comedy, I suppose, it's, it, it, and it's very, it feels very studio-bound, uh, even though it's set in, uh, in Egypt. It is, it is interesting. So I, I think sort of from, from episode 3... It becomes a, a chase through time and space, doesn't it? And it it mm. it's a wonderful vehicle for for Master Plan because it allows us to to see ancient Earth. You know, we get to go back to the time of the Egypt. So we get to see Earth in the in the far future, and we get to go yeah. to distant planets uh, and see aliens and have all of this sort of stuff going on. Classic mm. kind of sci-fi stuff. But that sort of Daleks chasing the Doctor through time and space is very much like the chase. But tonally, yes. it couldn't be any it couldn't be any more different, which I think is definitely a good thing. But Day of Armageddon is really interesting, isn't it? Because it's those first two episodes where it's really sort of upping the stakes. Yes, it's really making it's very gritty and exciting, and yeah, those stakes are being raised, aren't they? With every every moment that passes, and for me, I feel I feel the loss of. Of, of Devil's Planet even more keenly when I get to the end of Day of Armageddon because yeah. it's such a good cliffhanger and then you've got those snippets yeah. from Blue Peter but Devil's Planet would be such a wonderful episode of Master Plan to get back because to have that link is so exciting and it mm. is, as I say it's sort of those first three episodes that are, 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 are just absolutely kind of racing incredibly exciting stuff um, and then it gets a little bit more set piecey 
perhaps, mm. which isn't a bad thing, and I think it works really well. And you know, this is a, a absolutely massive story, the longest in, in Doctor Who's history. If you look at Trial of a Time Lord as, as kind of separate stories, yes, absolutely. You know, and it, and it holds its pace throughout that, and is absolutely incredibly well put together. I think, considering mm. the limitations that they must have been working with, I think you know, I. The final episode, the destruction of time. If I could have mm. one episode back, it would be that because that's when it all comes together, and you've got some absolutely incredible dialogue. And I actually think you could make a brilliant reconstruction around the episodes we've got at the moment and that destruction of time. But you need that destruction of time episode, which sadly is 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 missing, um, possibly for good, which is heartbreaking. But second to that, I think Devil. Devil's Planet episode mm. three would be an incredible, an incredible story to get back. Mm. So yes, I'm I'm thinking about those the three episodes that we have. I mean, other than the characters of the Doctor and Stephen and uh, Mavic Chen, and I suppose Daleks from time to time as well. As you, you might almost feel that they were from three different stories. I mean, they they. It's not that they don't that, that there isn't a through line between them, but but each each one of them has quite a different tone in them. You know, they could they could almost I guess be from three different things. Yeah, they could, and you've got the meddling monk in there as well. Don't forget, yes. he's sort of he's the he's the thread that sort of stitches a few of those those sort of quite separate episodes together. Yeah. Um, absolutely, brilliantly portrayed. Um, he's it's Peter Butterworth. He almost. Hartnell's master, if you want to look at it that way, yes, um, yeah, yeah. A kind of a, a fellow time lord, perhaps, with uh, with a TARDIS who uh, likes to be mischievous and change history for his own ends. Um, so yeah, you know, this oh, just so much good stuff in Master Plan, isn't there? It really is, you know. Seeing the monk play all those tricks on the Doctor, and uh, you know Hartnell having to contend with that while. Hmm. Legging it from the Daleks, and you know you've got ancient Egypt kind of in there, and Earth in the future, jungle scenes. You know, it's just it's got mm. everything. Yeah, it's when it's Doctor Who at its zenith, I think. Yeah, and it feels that that Carnell comes into his own as a as a comic actor in the in the sort of latter part of his era, and, and having someone like Peter Butterworth to play off, really, uh, I, I think you know enables him to bring that kind of thing to the fore yeah absolutely absolutely it's just a great foil isn't it it's it's, it's yeah. yeah i mean there's this there's so much there's so much to love about master plan i've never ever been able to watch just one episode of it that's how exciting it is you know you just you watch it and then you want to watch the next one and then you want to watch the next one and even the reconstructions are, are brilliant I know they're not for everyone um, but I think that I think the Luke's kind of reconstructions are superb mm. I think um, the stuff that Josh Nares has done is absolutely brilliant and of course you could just listen to the audio as well you know there's so yeah. many ways to enjoy this story it's just a shame we can't watch three quarters of it mm. and after working on it for so long I mean do you know every line of dialogue now <laughs> yeah, I reckon I could probably repeat it back to you verbatim. Yeah, it, it, when I started out doing this, yeah, the reason I picked this episode is because I had to ask myself the question: why? Why do you even want to colorize Doctor Who anyway? You know, there's a lot of people who just think it should remain in black and white, and I think actually that's a completely valid opinion. Hmm. But there's a huge amount of people, and they, you know, it needs to be respected. This because it's a growing number of people who won't watch black and white stuff. They're just not used to it. They've they've not grown up in the same sort of maybe generations and watched the same stuff we have. They have an intrinsic block. As soon as something appears that's in black and white, they don't want to watch it. And I'm I'm you know I'm in my early thirties, but I love sixties Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Probably makes me a bit of an outlier. So when I see kind of people in my peer group and stuff, and I talk you know about kind of this that the other. They're just not that just glaze over as soon as they see that it's in black and white they have no interest in it whatsoever so I wanted to create something that sort of reintroduced it to them because for me 60s Doctor Who is the greatest era the show ever achieves I mean there's Doctor Who's just brilliant full stop but that Hartnell Troughton 63 to 69 is 
almost unparalleled in its vision and its its brilliance. And I think to find you know to find people not watching that simply because it was in black black and white was a little bit of a, a travesty. So uh, I wanted to pick an episode that was incredibly exciting and had loads of action and a huge amount of pace mm. to it because without being rude if i had colorized an episode of um the web planet yeah or episode three of the sensor rights i don't know whether it would have had the same reaction mm. but as soon as you see daleks with flamethrowers burning down a jungle and things exploding you know it's instantly more exciting um so from that point of view i wanted you know it was something that not only was it going to keep my interest over the six years i was working on it but also potentially it would be something pacing wise that would be familiar to just a new series audience yeah yeah uh, i think that makes a lot of sense and 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 i think also uh, so so i think it works on that level and i think perhaps also for um for fans who are more traditional it being standalone or or being one of a series of of um, orphaned episodes from the daleks master plan then again there's you know there's some sense to it because you don't have to do a whole story. Oh, well, I mean, there's. Yeah, I'm sure you'd love to have the opportunity, but but you know, at, at this rate, as far as we can tell, you're not going to get the opportunity. So, so it so it's a, it, it's a nice one off to be able to have a look at. Yeah, I mean that that is quite a nice thing, you know. Like if I think I've done episode one of you know or any kind of existing, fully existing story, people will be like, great, and I do the rest, which would. <laughs> <laughs> probably irk me slightly yeah you know um but doing this allows me just to add a little bit of color and life you know and there are also doctor who fans out there that haven't watched this episode before i know that might sound incredible to you and i but mm. if it hasn't had a standalone dvd release there's loads of people who don't own lost in time mm. you know there's a when we had our premiere over in in los angeles there were people watching that episode for the very first time and their very first experience of it of it was in color. <laughs> that's that's kind of mind blowing, isn't it? But yeah. that's you know that that's that's cool. I think you know that's like that's that's just quite interesting. Um, and in terms of what you're saying about you know its its role um, within the kind of wider story, it, it I guess it's just it gives us twenty five percent of of the visuals. You know, it gives us that sort of that glimpse into into what not only what what did master plan look like you know what did tv of the time look like you know Mm. what did what was doctor who like at the time you know it it, it sort of answers loads of loads of questions for me you know when you watch a loose cannon recon yeah and there's that excitement when a steel sort of bursts into life yes and starts moving and you get five seconds of of clip or something yeah there's something about that that just makes it feel so real and immediate and fresh Mm. and i guess like i wanted that feeling again watching an episode i know backwards you know i wanted to see like well does this feel different in color and it absolutely does it absolutely changes the feel of it you know it's some people will hate it some people will love it i hope you know both versions are kind of always you know i don't want there to ever be a sort of it's i hope you know we get to a point where the bbc only colorize everything and they only release color versions i think that would be awful but i just think it's wonderful to have a bit of choice out there and for people to maybe think oh i wonder what it was like this and to be able to do that you know the technology is there now to do this mm. sort of thing so i think it's just it's, it's interesting from just a, a, a purely historical point of view what did these things look like what did they feel like you know what was the audience expecting at the time and then just breathing a little bit of kind of life into it sure yeah i, I think i was kind of on the fence really or, or or not particularly interested in in the idea of colorization um, uh, but then my my mind was changed when i saw the clip that kieran did of of the start of celestial toy maker episode four which you know just popped up on I, I guess on twitter a couple of three years ago and looking at that i suddenly thought oh gosh that does that does make the thing feel a bit more immediate, and also I think with that particular one, because the the sets are so so bright and colourful in the in the stills that we have of them, it kind it, it you get a you get a real yeah it, it, it's 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 much more impressive I think than you know again maybe some kind of 
more stagey adaptation. That that particular one, I think, was really lifted by being able to see it in colour. So, so that did change my mind. We, it, it totally. I mean, that story is so vibrant. It absolutely lends itself to colorization. Like you know, I, I think you and I, if we were transported right now to the toy maker's kingdom, I think we'd be both quite shocked if it was monochrome. Hmm. I think it feels like it should live in bright, wonderful '60s Technicolor. Yeah. Um, and Kieran's a phenomenal artist as well. And you know, so is everybody that that works on this. You know, Justin and, and Scott as well. Absolutely brilliant. But I think there's a. I think actually there's a there's there's an issue with colorization, you know. And there's a, there's a lot of perfectly good arguments for why it shouldn't be around. But I I sort of come back to it was it was definitely it was a budgetary reason that Doctor Who wasn't made in color. Hmm. Now, absolutely, because of that budgetary reason, the sets were done a certain way, etc., etc., etc. You know, what color would you have painted the TARDIS, etc., etc. But had there been budget available, they would have absolutely filmed this series in colour. Um, and I think it would have been absolutely even better for it. So I think if you can do colorization well and you can restore these things um, and make them look how they could have looked at the time, I think that's brilliant and that's exciting and that gets people really kind of interested and it sparks a whole debate. I think the real problem we've got at the moment are kind of like people are looking for for shortcuts because it's an unbelievably time intensive difficult job yes and the result of that means they're looking for automation and i think yeah. some automation is fine i think some automation can help i think that's sensible but when you're getting kind of um computer ai just to essentially do the work for you and you create these kind of brown sludgy flickery messes yeah i actually i think it's massively harmful to the cause i think mm. it's re- i think it's a real real problem you know like i really want that sort of software to get to a point where it looks brilliant i really do i yeah. really do however at the moment it's not there yet um and i'm not impressed when i see it and actually i think it kind of it damages uh, it damages the argument because people are seeing that and thinking that's what colorization looks like in the same way they watch those kind of 80s yeah. um is it was a casablanca or or, or whatnot that were really badly colorized yeah. very loose kind of washy colours that didn't have any detail to them um, and didn't really sit in the characters you know and, yeah. and uh, you know, the technology's there but you need to know how to use it and you need to work at it and you need to make sure it, it, it kind of comes together mm. because otherwise if you just you know I love the enthusiasm for it I think that's fantastic but I think if you're just going to run stuff through um, and sort of produce stuff that isn't good enough my concern is people think that's what colorization is and that's not what colorization should be Yes, no, I I remember you know those efforts in the eighties. I think Laurel and Hardy was the thing that I saw, and it, mm. you know it, it was it was as if people were painting on the screen in a very limited palette, and yeah, it didn't have any of the of the normal gradation of color. It it looked kind of artificial, mm. uh, and I and I I think I also agree with you with with the um, with this modern AI thing. I mean it's. It, it 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 falls just the wrong side of the uncanny valley. I think you know it it uh, it's almost brilliant, but unfortunately, because it isn't quite brilliant, it falls all the way back down again. So, as a curiosity, yeah, fine. I mean, it's it's you know it's worth spending twenty seconds on uh, you know on somebody's effort on Twitter, having a quick look at it and saying, oh yeah, I, I sort of see what that might look like if it was in color, but but I'm not going to sit and watch it for twenty five minutes because. It's just too too hard work, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I, and I think there's there's definitely there's there's different kind of amount of sort of weighting you can put to the arguments around colorization as well. You know, um, we you, you mentioned the sort of quite unsophisticated colorizations that stuff came about in the late eighties and early nineties. You know, um, these things weren't ideal. Using kind of automated stuff now isn't I- ideal. A manual hand colorized sequence can take ages and it can also fail mm. it can also just not work yeah and that's that's really hard to take you know you've just got to you've got to think i've invested these hours but it's not working why is it not working okay let's go back um and that's why i i think it's best to do these things as a team because i think if you look at something so long 
you know, I started doing all sorts of green skin tones and stuff because my eyes had just gone after hours and hours and hours of looking at a screen. But yeah, you need to, I think you need a team, you need to have a really good working relationship um, and you need to sort of kind of be open to, to criticism as well and take that on the chin. But yeah, I think as long as people are, you know, live and let live, if, if, if clips aren't kind of doing any harm, the original is always available um, and I, I, don't, I don't think there's really too much of an argument to be had against it. Yeah, I remember my uh, my art teacher many years ago saying to me that you know your, your eye sees all sorts of colour and your 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 brain sort of corrects for it, but at, you know, but actually the, the the colour that you're seeing is quite different probably from the from what you think you're seeing. That you know, in any given bit of skin tone, there's probably you know there's a huge variety of different colours. It's not all one thing, but but your oh, yeah. your, your brain c- corrects for all the shadows and one other and sort of sees it as one colour. It's true, and, and and you know, skin tones are the hardest thing to get right. And it's uh, you mentioned the uncanny valley. It's the first thing you look at and you know is wrong. And it, it takes a you know, it's not just your skin. It's not a one size fits all solution. You know, it's got a weirdly luminescent quality, hasn't it? You know, it mm. reacts differently in different lights. You know, sometimes it yeah. sort of lets the light bounce off. Sometimes it sort of kind of it it does weird stuff. You know, but. But also you know that around your earlobes, around your nose, perhaps around your chin, you're going to get certain shades of kind of maybe red. You can look at the greens and the yellow. There is, there's dozens if not hundreds of colours going on. Yeah. And they're not bright red. They're sort of purpley, pinky red. Mm. And then the colour balance you go for there is going to affect the way the greens look. And, you know, everything is sort of hanging in a sort of balance and you do need to get it right uh, and it is it is quite tricky kieran is unbelievably good at skin tones he's uh, he's my he's my he's my go-to when i'm really struggling with that <laughs> but it, yeah it's definitely um it, it, it's it's an art not a science getting those right mm. yeah and, and and i think it's really only as you say an uh another person who can who can tell you whether you've got it right or not there there isn't any formula or uh, you know yeah calculation that's really going to explain that to people it, it's just how it looks in the end absolutely hmm. yeah so so with this particular one then you've you you've got a large variety of different stuff i mean you've got the the stuff that's set in the forest or the jungle whatever it is that's, that's i guess that's quite dark and and uh, you've got scenes of bits of alien vegetation there you've got the 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 city and again there's kind of dark corners as well as bright bits in that um and then there's this the the, the spaceship as well so there's, there's quite a variety of different scenes for you to be working with yeah there was um and we all sort of took ownership over it a certain bit the jungle stuff was mostly kieran mm-hmm. i know scott worked incredibly hard with with justin um on the spa Right. Internal shots, you know. Yeah. Thanks. Scott also did a lot of the uh, model work as well, of the spa landing, etc. Right. Yeah. Uh, Scott and Kieran did a lot of the famous jungle burning sequence. Yes. Which looks fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I did mostly the interiors of the city, which were great because I that provided me with a lot of kind of uh, areas of of darkness and shade. You know, it had some wonderful. Uh, machines on the wall and as you pan past from light bits suddenly there you know there's a huge shade where dalek sort of lurks and you need to make sure that the brightness of the hemispheres is sort of matching up as the dalek moves out of the shade into the light you know there's a lot of challenges in there but uh mm. it's incredibly fun yeah we all sort of took ownership of uh certain sets really yes yeah and and so we so we, i mentioned it briefly earlier on but there's, there's a certain lack i think of reference material to help you with what colors you might have to use in terms of i suppose primarily co- costumes or sets or so on so so how did you make the decisions around what colors to make things where we had color references we used them i believe there's a rehearsal as a color photo of a, a rehearsal shot of uh, episode four i think right so that was incredibly helpful in terms of uh, we knew the exact color of Mavic Chen's blue kind of top. Uh-huh. He wasn't wearing uh, Kevin Stoney wasn't in full makeup, so we didn't know that. But yeah, it did provide a lot of helpful stuff. Obviously, the Daleks we we know about already. Um, mm. But yeah, we where we could we found color references. So the model of the spa 
for example, still exists to the day. We got some nice HD photos of it in colour, mm. um, and we were able to lift exactly the colour that it is onto the onto the black and white. So that was quite a fun achievement. Yeah, uh, yeah. And then you know, there's little things as when you see um, this one of the most wonderful scenes in it is Chen sort of kind of hiding behind almost prison like bars as you see the reflection yes. of the burning jungle bounce off it. That was a really fun one to do. You know, we got lots of the fire kind of overlays going. Um, but yeah, you know, where we where we could, we found color references. Where colour references um, didn't exist, we, we took a sort of best guess. You know, we had a thing, well, what what did this probably look like? <laughs> you know, was was this reused in the uh, in, in the Pertwee era? You know, like uh, in the spa, there's a set of controls. We don't have any colour references for that. But we know there's some similar stuff used during the Pertwee era. Um, obviously it would have been recycled so we just mm. sort of found the right sort of colors for that sort of machinery yeah. and put it in there and it just works it's perfect it just sits how it should sit and then other things we sort of just made a a, a, a decision on you know yeah i believe we found a interview from about 10 years ago with jean marsh where she recalled that her uniform was brown not green right. so you know whether her memory was right or, or wrong is question for debate but she said it was brown so that gave us a decision you know that was quite fun so it was stuff like that and then if we had no idea and no references we just went went with what felt right and yeah there was four of us in the group if it was a controversial decision in any way we took a vote on it and uh, i'd have the uh if it was a tie break i'd i'd, I'd pull rank <laughs> and do what i wanted <laughs> yeah and who's going to tell you that you're wrong now anyway yeah. Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Peter Purse has a wonderful memory for these things. Right. So maybe. he's um, He was planning to come to uh, the UK premiere Good Day of the Doctor, uh, where no doubt he would have just told me, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, <laughs> which I would have been very grateful for. Uh, I'm absolutely keeping everything across so that he can come and make it when it's all rearranged. Yes. Yes, well, I, I mean, I was... Um holding a ticket for that for the for the very same reason and so yeah i mean i'll, I'll be uh, be very pleased uh, if it can be rearranged and uh, and, and t- to see it so yeah i mean at the moment i'm i'm living on the the fumes from the um the clip that you released and also the few snatches of it that appeared in josh snares's video that, that he had on his youtube channel yeah we gave josh a few things to include which is which was fun um, and I loved how he displayed them in monitors and things, so yes. you don't get a full clean <laughs> image, which is nice. Because we do want to keep a little bit of excitement around this, you know, um, it was a labour of love. We want people to really enjoy it without YouTube compression doing its thing. And we wanted, you know, it's only 25 minutes. If we give too much away, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin the effect. We want it to be exciting and new and yeah. cool when you see it. Yes, yeah, so you did successfully launch it. It was uh, it was Galley One in LA. Yes, and Kieran was there to to talk people through it. So I've heard the reaction was uh, was uh, splendid from that. Oh, they were, yeah, they, my Twitter feed just melted, <laughs> and yeah, it was incredible. Kieran uh, told me there was about a thousand people in the room. Mm-hmm. It was just a really interactive, brilliantly fun way to watch the episode, and I really hope we can recreate it over here um, when good days rearranged because. Mm people sort of like they laughed and whooped and cheered at the right moments you know when Hartnell does his will you shut up sir everyone sort of <laughs> kind of went wild and when you know uh, when Stephen first appears everyone loves it and uh, it, it was just you know people really took it in the spirit that it was intended and really kind of enjoyed it and yeah it was I, I still I can't believe it happened I can't believe this little pet project I decided to do kind of you know, I managed to get this amazing team together to work on it, and we got it over the line. Um, it's very, very easy to could have walked away at any point. Yes. During that very, very long, difficult process, you know, um, and there were, you know, there was months and months and months and months where things just weren't going right, or they didn't kind of look how they should. But we just kept going. We held ourselves to a really high standard. And we just wanted to produce something that looked like it was shot in colour. Because if you don't, then there's just no point, really. Mm. So we really we really tried, and for it to get the reaction it did, barely any criticism, 
was absolutely uh, just it just uh, just makes me feel so so happy and proud mm. and excited and I'm just so grateful that people enjoyed it I really am it was so cool it was one of the, it was definitely one of the most exciting days of my life without a doubt mm. yeah I remember um chatting a few months ago with um Andrew Ireland who who remade the mission to the unknown with the uh, University of Central Lancashire and um you know him I guess making a, a similar comment that you know I mean I, I dare say there's the odd person who who complained here and there but on the whole the 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 nervousness I think about sending something that you spent a long time thinking and working on out into the wild and then the relief and, and the pleasure at, at the, the reception coming back to you being you know overwhelmingly positive yeah I mean and he did absolutely phenomenal work how exciting was that I've spoken to him quite a lot actually post that yeah um, I, just to let him know I do have a working time destructor in my garage if he ever wants to do any more master plan episodes right. and I've got I've got a Dalek which will be at his full beck and call <laughs> should he need it um but yeah I you know I can I can see the similarities there you know it, it's your baby really like you you go everywhere with it you think about it you worry about it you put everything you can into it and then you sort of just offer it out to the world and you know people behind keyboards can sometimes be much harsher critics than perhaps they would be if they if you were in the room with them yeah so you know and in both instances there was just overwhelming love for it and it just shows you you know like the Doctor Who community, especially on Twitter, is so supportive and mm. so brilliant. And it really is a little bit special, you know. Even these watch-alongs everybody's been doing and um, Quiz of Rassilon's been kind of gone online. Yeah. It, it just, it's, just, it's just people getting behind something that they love and enjoying it, you know. Not every year of the show will be for everybody. Some people will grumble about this, that, or the other. But ultimately, we all we all love it, and it's all a little bit of fun. And you know, a lot of us have made you know great friendships out of it, and we enjoy it. So, it's uh, it, yeah, it, it's a great fandom, and there's nothing quite like it when everyone seems to come together. And it's been happening more and more regularly. Like you say, with Andrew Island staff, with the colorization of Day of Armageddon, and with all these watch alongs, like it just there's a real community mm. there. It's it's wonderful. Yes, I mean from from my own point of view, I guess you know what led to this podcast was was uh, getting involved with a bunch of people on a forum about missing episodes. I mean, actually, one of the most noxious environments I can recall in a way, and yet out of it came. Uh, a bunch of friends who, who uh, you know, we get together on a regular basis and talk about the, the show and and, uh, and enjoy doing that. And you know, amazingly, you know, there's a few people who like to uh, tune in and listen to it. So we we do doubly well there. But even if nobody was listening, at least we'd have fun t- talking about it among ourselves. <laughs> well, that's the main thing, you know. But people love it. People enjoy hearing your opinions and thoughts, and the people are supportive around it, and they share and they retweet and they and they like what you put out there and it's just yeah it's it's all the good stuff or found and rolled into one hmm. so has doing this piece of work then given you a, an appetite for doing more i mean are you, are you just sort of relaxing and enjoying the fact that you've got it done and and, and kind of you know not really <laughs> what you'd have to wait into something else or or is, has it has it got your juices going well i i can't sit still i i have to have stuff going on um i have yeah. about a thousand different projects happening at once um which is completely unmanageable and uh, terrible at managing my time and uh, you know it's just a disaster but Kieran, he's definitely on board. He wants to do another one. Scott wants to do another one. It, I think I think we'll be doing another one. <laughs> um, and I think we all know what it's going to be. Right. Um, I think I, Kieran just wants to colourise a, a couple of, of clips and get, get I think, some a little bit further with his Celestial Toy Maker. Yes. Um, but he's otherwise back on board. Scott, I think, needs... That poor guy, that sparse scene at the bro- uh, at the end, I think broke him. He needs a couple of weeks to uh, decompress and relax, like any sane human being would. Um, and I'm uh, I'm already working on on something because I just can't wait, <laughs> can't wait about. So um, yeah, there's 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 stuff happening. Yeah, yeah, we're working on it. And if if the BBC were to want to release the the colour version on a DVD, 
would you be up for that? Is that sort of thing that would would? Uh, oh yeah, I mean, that, it would be a dream come true. Yeah, I just well, I'd love to get it to the widest possible audience. To be honest with you, mm. um, I just you know, I've we've made something um, creative and we want people to watch it, mm. but we don't own Doctor Who. We don't own the copyright either. No. It, there's absolutely no way I'll be just uploading it to, to no. the world and letting people watch it because that would be that would break about a thousand laws and I don't want to get in any trouble. So, no, we've not shared it with anyone. Uh, we're hoping it can get some form of official release so yeah. that people can enjoy it. That would be amazing. Hmm. We'll have to see. Yeah, okay. Okay, look, that, that's that, that's fantastic, and you know we've we, we've we've chatted for um, the time we said we would. So, look, thanks thanks very much for coming on and talking about Day of Armageddon and, and the colorization project. It, it's been it's been very interesting and fun to have you on board. Oh, thanks! It's been an absolute pleasure. Really enjoy really enjoy talking about it. Yeah, and, and, I, and I look forward to being able to see it later this year um, when we when we get the chance. Yeah, and I look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Kieran Hyman's already appeared once on this podcast for our popular Down Under episode, which is still available from all good podcast apps and a few bad ones. Hello, Kieran. Hello. How's it going? Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. I'm glad we're able to speak to you. Yep, no, it's good to be back. What you share in common with with Rich is an enthusiasm for, for colourising the black and white stories of Doctor Who. And last time you were with us, you, you shared a beautiful colour clip of the beach scene from Enemy of the World. And now you've only gone and colourised a whole Doctor Who episode with your, with your three friends. Yes. One was a bit easier to accomplish than the other. Uh, I think <laughs> I did that Enemy of the World clip in few days but this one took us all in all in all about six years i think yeah yeah so before you began the the, the project i mean how how aware were you of day of armageddon was it was it an episode you knew well uh yeah yeah it was um an episode that well it's probably one of the first orphan episodes i saw on the um lost in time box set right because i remember when it was found yeah and uh the first episode I went to watch on that box set was the Celestial Toymaker episode mm. four, as that was you know, my favourite story. Uh-huh. And uh, directly after that, I went on to the Dalek episode on the disc, mm. Day of Armageddon. So yeah, it's it's always been you know one that I've held in high regard. Okay, I mean I, I was I was interested that that you remember it coming back because uh, I mean I was going to say that you're probably still in short trousers when it happened. I was. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's interesting really thinking about it. You know, my inspiration for, for getting into colorization is sort of intertwined with the discovery of that episode, Day of Armageddon, uh, in that I started watching Doctor Who in 2003, late 2003, when it was being repeated on the ABC here. Uh-huh. And I was only about five years old. And I got. Yeah, you know, my my mother bought me a, a reference book, a Doctor Who the Legend, which uh, had pages on every Doctor Who story, and the the page on the Celestial Toymaker had these beautiful colour photographs, and that's what I think, you know, stuck with me. Yeah, you know, the desire to see classic you know, 60s Doctor Who in colour stems yeah. from the the beautiful colour photographs, hmm. and um, when it came to pass that obviously. The Celestial Time Maker wasn't shown on TV in the the run of repeats. Yeah. I, I suddenly started looking at, you know, wh- why is this happening? And I discovered, obviously, missing episodes, which were talked about in that book. And I got my parents to look up online if there was, you know, any, any more information about missing episodes. Yeah. And uh, just so happened that the top news story in the Doc 2 world that week was <laughs> the discovery of the day of Armageddon. Right. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, I kept, kept checking back every week there <laughs> and, and uh, seeing if there were more, but uh, no, didn't uh-huh. happen for another eight years. 
Yeah, it's a shame if you, if only you've been um, born thirty years beforehand. They were coming back, you know, no end of a rate in the nineteen eighties, but but sadly not so much in the two thousands. Yeah, but it was qu- quite exciting when, you know, finally we did get more, the enemy of the world and uh, yeah, Web of Fear. Yeah, indeed. As I was discussing with Rich, it, it's it's a uh, it's an interesting story this one because it, it's a real window into a, an era that's almost completely lost i mean certainly katarina doesn't turn up anywhere else brett vian not really a companion mm. but but also this is his only turnout you know it, it's quite lucky that you know we found of all the episodes that we could have found at that point of dalek's master plan that we found one of the first four mm. which is sort of uh, you know a very different section of the story in that you've got brett and katarina and, you know, so now we have the three episodes with five and ten very spaced out quite well to get a good impression of the story overall. Mm. Yeah, indeed. And you must have become extraordinarily familiar with the story through the, the long process of colorizing it. Yes, yeah, so I could sort of, you know, tell you everything that happens in that episode backwards, <laughs> you know, and what color it all is. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Are there any particular favourite moments for you in the episode? I suppose certainly of the the shots that I did would be the uh, Mavic Chen behind the bars with the uh, flickering yeah. red light of the, the burning jungle. But also just uh, the, the early shots in the episode with you know the four regulars discussing uh, you know, that scene that ends with uh, the Doctor telling Brett to shut up. That's, yes. that, that, that's a nice scene, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in terms of the colorizing, then, I mean, you've you've talked about the motivation for doing it, for, of seeing those those fantastic color photos, and I, and I have to say that, uh, as I mentioned to Rich, I, I, I was in two minds about about colorizing sixties Doctor Who until I saw that clip you you did of the um, Celestial Toymaker episode four, the start of it, and that really changed my oh, mind yes. because. As you say, that those fantastic colour photos that there are of those sets, suddenly it all springs to life, and it feels quite different from from the black and white feel. Mm. Yeah, it it really does open it up. I think you know, looks so different. It gives a whole new life to it. Opens it up to not just you know people who wouldn't normally watch a black and white program otherwise. Mm. But I think it can open it up to Doc 2 fans who wouldn't otherwise watch a particular episode. I mean, Dave Armageddon, you know, I think it's a popular episode. It's got the Daleks. People like Daleks' master plan. But something like The Celestial Toymaker sort of has a reputation for being a bit boring and plodding and somewhat predictable plot-wise. So a way you can, you know, sort of give it a new life in people's estimation is to change it visually bring the color into it so that mm. it looks different i mean there there are a few stories i think that would benefit visually from color in the ways that others wouldn't for instance uh you know maybe even the dominators but the the web planet some like you look at the color photos from the sensor uh you know maitland spaceship very colorful mm. you know the control room there so i think those stories that are somewhat you know, lacking in, in in reputation, so to say, hmm. could be improved by, you know, being made in colour and sort of brought to the fore a bit more, in that sense. Sure. Because there are other stories that benefit less from colourisation, such as, like, The Web of Fear is one people talk about. Very moody, hmm. atmospheric thing. There's less to gain, despite it being... Because it's such a good story... Mm. on its own anyway yeah and i guess it, it's it's so dark it might be hard to get a lot of color into it i don't know i mean i'm not a, i'm not really you know in, in into the technicalities of it mm. you, you, yeah you can always color it realistically to what it would look like but some stories because like, it's the 60s you want it to be stunning technicolor yeah uh, that sort of style doesn't suit every story no. So whilst I'd like to have every story fully colorized, just you know, so so that we have that way of mm. watching it, I think if um, someone like me putting a lot of manual hours into it, 
there are some stories that I'd, I'd prioritise over others. The ones I think that would just benefit more visually, like the chase yeah. and the web planet. I mean, I guess perhaps you could have in your mind something like uh, Batman or or Star Trek from this, as mm. examples of 60s series where the, the colour's very vivid. Yeah, the prisoner as well and the Avengers. Yeah, yeah. And, there, and there are certainly some Doctor Who stories that, that, are, that are like that. And then, of course, there are others that are, that are more muted in colour. And, and, and certainly the, uh, the colour in the, in the Pertwee era is quite muted in, in, in uh, a lot of cases, although in some cases that's simply because the, the, um, it hasn't survived all that well <laughs> over the years one way or another. Yes. Yeah. Is that something that you, know, you that could also be looked at in terms of of uh, correcting the the faded colour of the Pertwee episodes? Could be certainly um, the ones that are particularly lacking. I've seen um, you know work on Invasion of the Dinosaurs episode one. Yeah. Which is now currently sort of the worst looking quality wise. Hmm. Obviously, Mind of Evil episode one. Yes. was the worst looking in the sense that it didn't have any colour at all hmm. but that's been done very well but I think you know, most of the, the colour recovery on like the Mind of, Mind of Evil and uh, Ambassadors of Death is quite good hmm. but it, it, it could be improved I'm sure Sure. and in terms I guess of your practice of, of, of colourising I mean is, is was it something that is, is a lot of trial and error or, or well I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of that too but I mean were you able is there any great source on the on the web that that enabled you to get started or did you just have to have a crack yourself I think I started out just having a crack myself on um you know after effects and uh, photoshop and mm. really just sort of teaching yourself and coming up with new ways it was a lot of trial and error working even on this Day of Armageddon project, in that one of the many reasons that it, it took so long to complete was that we'd go so far, and then we'd find a new sort of better technique hmm. uh, for for doing a certain element, and we'd go back and sort of start great sections again, hmm. just to make sure we we could get it the best that we felt we could, amongst other reasons, of course, why it took so long. You know, hmm. Life gets in the way and that sort of thing. Well, indeed, yeah. I mean, you know, you're, you're doing it for, for fun. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it has to be to your timetable, doesn't it? So, so Rich said that you're particularly talented at skin tones. Uh, ah. <laughs> so I, I, I wondered what it what that situation particularly requires. Well, I'd, I'd have to say that Richard is, you know, comparable to me in every way in skin tones, but um, it's very kind of him. No, yeah, it, it's really just you need the ability to judge what the lighting in this situation what effect it would have on the skin tone because hmm. otherwise you run the risk of um, giving all the skin tone throughout the episode the same quality yeah which might look right as you're working on it but then when you look at the whole thing in its entirety hmm. it doesn't look right because these things you know skin tone so variable yes it, it changes quite a lot in in just with the turn of a head and yeah. the shadow falls in a different way it looks different and light bouncing color light bouncing around it's going to have a different quality hmm. and is is there a particular piece of color work on this uh day of armageddon project that, that you're particularly happy with or you think comes off particularly well hmm I think um, one of the the choices that we made right at the end, which is when we were working on the final sequence in which all the delegates and Daleks are running around in chaos, that was <laughs> shot 90. Yeah. Richard worked on that and I came in and helped with um, the delegates. We made the decision to uh, give the flashing lights mm. uh, at the top of the set this uh, red tint to the whole thing because it was yeah. an emergency situation you know yeah and i think that that was something we weren't quite sure of mm. but i think really came off and when it screened at gallifrey one there was a couple of people who, who mentioned that specifically afterwards saying mm. you know that, that was a nice creative choice so i think that came off quite well yes yes yeah, so so i i i noticed that in the clips that appear in the um 
Josh Snares video, that that's one where where you can see that sort of slightly strobe effect with the red light. Um, mm. I, 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 I laughed because I mean it will mean nothing to you, but uh, some of our listeners might remember a program called Runaround with with Mike Reed, a Cockney presenter, where you know about every five minutes he'd just shout "Run around" and everyone would sort of dive in different directions. And it just it, it just there's a funny quality of of all of the delegates running in all over the place for that sort of oh, yes. ten or fifteen seconds, I guess. Well, I can I can definitely say that would be before my time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, you've you've started to allude to it, but I wanted to talk to you about the the reception that you got when you presented the film at uh, the Gallifrey Convention. I mean, first off, I guess you were sitting in, on stage in front of hundreds of people. So um, yeah, what was that experience? About, about like? a thousand people, I think, was right. estimated at the end. Yeah. Oh, you know, it was incredible, really. You know, being able to finally sort of show off the, what you've been working on for mm. so long in, in front of a, a group of people who don't have to be there. They're, they're a group of people who you know are, are predisposed to enjoying yeah. what you're showing them because yeah. they, they've come to that particular panel. So, yeah, it was a very, very warm appreciation. And it was just great, even divorced from the fact that it was in colour, mm. watching the episode in a group of people like that. Mm. And you know, hearing all the the cheers and laughs at certain points, points I wouldn't have even imagined. You know, like um, uh, when you see one of the the delegates, I think Salation, doing his funny walk as he walks down the the ramp in the the Dalek City. Mm-hmm. Everyone gives that a laugh. That was quite good. No, oh, yes. So I, I never never really thought about it, but it is quite funny. Yeah. And and the cheers when uh, Hartnell grabs the Tranium Core at the end. Because that is, of course, you know, it's, a, it's an important part of the whole story, is the, the moment he steals the, crane, the terranium core. Yes. And everyone, yeah, cheers, and then immediately laughs as the shot pans over to Zephon running down the road <laughs> yeah. with his hands tied. Yeah, naked so Zephon. that's quite good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. So Rich was saying there's lots of reaction online. I mean, I, I, I guess as well as in the hall, there must have been um, some discussion afterwards too. Yeah, yeah, we got a lot of people, you know, just... Because uh, I was sat just, uh, you know, to the side of, of the room where sort of the technicians are, you know, with all the computers. And I was just watching w- watching the episode and watching people's reaction. And then, you know, w- walked into the crowd as it finished mm. over to my friends and people just giving their compliments. I mean, uh, people were very kind about it. And everyone... I was asking people, you know, what their favourite parts were. And I think... Uh, with with everyone who I asked, I got about every part of the episode was mentioned <laughs> at least once as, yeah. as somebody's favourite bit, which is you know brilliant. It's yes, really, you know, you know, makes you proud of your work that yeah. people have picked out you know all of it as as being something to talk about. Yeah, and I guess it means that your three other colleagues can all feel happy that the bits that they did uh, you know have all been appreciated by someone. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, and, you know, someone would mention, oh, I like that, that shot in the jungle, and I said, oh, yes, I did that. And then they'd say, <laughs> you know, I like like the shot in the Dalek City, and I said, well, I'll pass that on to Richard, who did that bit, <laughs> and uh, you know, Justin and Scott, who did the others. Yeah. And the spa sequences people talked about. Mm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to when we can see it in the UK. It, it was uh, frustrating for the, um, for the showing to be postponed, but... You know, we mm. we understand entirely why, and and uh, but yeah, be, be yeah, good to get the chance finally to see it. Yeah, yes, I I understand the event. The event is going to be postponed, but we just don't know when at the moment. No, indeed, it would be a bit a bit early to be start making too many plans, and mm. then have those ones disrupted as well. Sure. Yeah. And so. I understand that you, that you're continuing to work on um, the uh, Celestial Toymaker episode four. So that's, a, that's one of your projects that you're keen on. Yes, that that was the episode that I first started on when I was sort of teaching myself colorization, and it's one that I'd like to finish. I was also working on a colorization of Josh Snares's reconstruction of episode eight oh, of yes. the Alex Master Plan. I've no idea when that'll be finished, but uh, that's that's on the 
on the go at the moment as well. Mm-hmm. But I haven't actually been doing uh, Toy Maker just recently. I thought I'd, you know, in this lockdown, I'd be getting a lot of it done. But uh, I've sort of done some clips instead of uh, other things. I did a clip of Evil of the Daleks. I did a mm-hmm. clip of the goodies, and I did a clip of the Mind Robber. Mm-hmm. I saw the Evil of the Daleks one. That was that was very good. Yeah, it's it's a very nice moment in that episode. It is. It's a great scene. Which of course is 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 is, is another it's another one of my favourite episodes. That I mean, in, in in just as much as as you remember um, Dave Armageddon coming back, Evil of the Daleks is a really key one for me back in uh, 1987. And I I watched that one in a room of Doctor Who fans in a in a convention for the first time. And uh, it was absolutely electric. Right. So, and when was that? Uh, it, it, that would have been uh, about September 1987, something like that, I think. Oh, right. It was a it was a Doctor Who Appreciation Society one. And then it was released on VHS. I think the episode was found that year, and so it, it hadn't been around for very long before they put it on to show us that autumn. I, I don't know when it eventually came out. It, it probably took a wee while because they weren't really sticking stuff out at that stage. Yeah, because of course there was a time when you'd read about missing episodes being found and it still wasn't really any good to you because they weren't being released. No, indeed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was that was true of of almost all of them up till um, Tomb, I think, which came out very quickly on being found. But but yeah, most of the others, the VHSs started coming out in the late eighties, but they were fairly sparse and they were only interested in whole stories uh, to start off. Right. But yeah, I mean that, that's 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 a beautiful scene that, and I think the colourising is is nice and and the trout and blue shirt, I like that touch as well. Yes, I've been uh, looking at some colour photos, trying to figure out whether or not Trouton's shirt is still blue in season six. I think he, he goes to a white one. Right. So I had to think about that when I did that mind rubber colourisation. Uh huh. Yeah, when I did the, the Evil of the Daleks clip, I tried to make his shirt the same shade of blue as uh, in the three doctors yes because i think it's even you know darker he wears a very very light blue shirt in his run mm-hmm. but then you look at the three doctors and it's a more deep blue so it's a darker shade mm. which is not easy to pull off colorization wise but i also edited in that clip the uh, supreme dalek right well turned the dalek in the shot into the supreme dalek just because i've uh been looking at Day of Armageddon for so long, I'm used to seeing the Supreme there. <laughs> so I missed him. I wanted him around for a bit longer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, look, thanks for staying up and, and for, uh, for for sharing <laughs> those uh, thoughts and, and uh, uh, memories of, of, of the... That's uh, all right. ...of the project. And it's great to have no, you no on this, this episode. And we will certainly look forward... To I think in the, in the UK to seeing that when it when we get the chance and and also anything else that you're able to come come up with uh, in the coming years. Uh, absolutely, uh, yeah. I hope to have another one done, and we can all have a look at that as well. Uh, th- yeah, thanks for having me on again. I hope I don't sound too uh, half asleep <laughs> at the moment, but uh, hopefully we can uh, next time I'm on sort out a, a, a more amiable. <laughs> You know, time frame that works for us both. It's a yeah, bit indeed. difficult doing a, a cross-planet podcast like this. <laughs> it, it is. It, it, it always. That's is, the yeah. way it goes, though. Yeah, yeah. But thanks for being for for, uh, for staying. No up worries, for us. mate. <laughs>